Good morning, my name is Mark Alterman, and today we're going to talk about beta-hydroxybutyrate uh, uses in the intensive care unit and then especially in the setting of uh, DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. I'm an employee with JPS Physician Group and I work at JPS John Peter Smith Hospital in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, when I give talks, I like to give my disclosures and my biases. Uh, so first, my disclosures, I am on the Speakers Bureau for BioMariu, for Cubist, and for StandBio EKF. Uh, and Stand Bio is helping sponsor this talk today on beta-hydroxybutyrate. Uh, I think other thing that's important is I like to give my biases. Uh, I'm very opinionated about how we treat DKA. Um, I think the important thing to note is the overall mortality for DKA is less than 1%. And so when you look at studies about DKA, nobody really has enough patients uh, in a study to document differences in technique of treating patients to know which technique may be better than another. Uh, therefore, my opinion uh, is as, as good as an expert opinion in the other person. And finally, I want to comment about the idea about lab tests and people not wanting to lab, order a lot of lab tests. Once a patient's sick enough to be hospitalized, uh, you really don't save any money by ordering fewer lab tests. Your patients, uh, the expense of patients is really when you miss something and don't make the right diagnosis in a timely fashion. A little bit about me, uh, this is my 25th year. Uh, practicing uh, full-time critical care medicine. Uh, I've been at JPS Hospital for the last eight years. Prior to that, I was with Texas Tech Internal Medicine Department in Amarillo, Texas, and my first job was with Intermountain Healthcare in Ogden, Utah. A little bit about JPS. Our hospital uh, is in Fort Worth, Texas. It's about 500 beds. We are a level one trauma unit. Uh, we have about 36 mixed bed ICU patients. I deal primarily with the medicine patients, not the surgical patients. Uh, we do have a lot of progressive care unit patients, so in our facility, not all DKAs come to the intensive care unit. We can do insulin drips out on the floor, and so that may or may not be the case in your own facility, but when we're talking today, I'm primarily going to be talking about DKA patients requiring insulin drip. So whether they go to your intensive care unit or not, if they're requiring insulin drips, that's the primary population we're going to discuss today. So what about DKA? What is it? Well, it's an acute diabetic complication, primarily in the type 1 diabetics, uh, less so in the type 2. What causes it? Basically, lack of insulin and absolute amounts of lack or relative lacks of insulin. Um, and then you get the counter-regulatory hormones that start kicking in. And how is it diagnosed? It's diagnosed similar to other ways we diagnose things in internal medicine, which is history, physical, and a subset of lab tests. So again, as mentioned before, it's most most likely found in the type 1 diabetics. Occasionally you can see it in type 2 diabetics and there is some overlap uh, with the hyperosmolar uh, hyperglycemic syndrome. And it's important because when you have these patients that have uh, very, very high glucose levels, you really want to know whether their uh, acidosis is due to a DKA component or not. So we briefly talked about some of the causes of ketos, ketoacidosis. Um, the ketone buildup uh, in either the blood or the urine can result from uh, physiologic causes or pathologic causes. In the physiologic causes, you can see it in um, heavy exercise. Anyone who goes on a fast and is fasting will get some ketones in their system. And then the high fat diets, such as the Atkins diet that was popular, those are primarily low carbohydrates and will develop some ketosis. The pathologic causes that you see, um, you can see alcoholic ketoacidosis, um, glycogen, glycogen storage diseases that I really don't have as much experience with because I'm primarily an adult. Uh, ICU doctor. Um, you can get ketosis, although no acidosis, with uh, rubbing alcohol ingestion, but again today we're primarily talking about diabetes mellitus. These are signs and symptoms of diabetic ketoacidosis. I'm not going to go over all of them. You can look at them, but symptoms such as abdominal pain, lack of appetite, uh, frequent urination, and then signs of the patient when they do present to the hospital. Um, dry skin, heavy breathing, the fruity smell that people talk about. I personally have not been able to smell that myself. I don't rely on that to help me make the diagnosis, although I heard another physician in our facility talk about if he didn't have fruity smell, then they weren't in DKA. I don't personally rely on that. This is a slide on some of the uh, pathophysiology of DKA. Um, there's, in general, a lack of insulin, either absolute or relative. Um, and uh, the cells cannot take up glucose. And the body has three ways to compensate for that. Number one is to start using the stored glycogen in the liver to help bring out glucose. Secondly, the body starts using the amino acids and glycerol as a backbone to start making 
uh, more glucose. And then finally, the body starts metabolizing fats, and it's this fat metabolism that gives you the ketone bodies in the system. When you look at the diagnostic criteria, the uh, usual thing that you'll see stated is the top three, a serum glucose greater than 250, a pH less than 7.3, and a serum bicarb less than 18 on your chemistry panel. Um, I think it is important to, that you really need to document that this acidosis is coming from ketosis in some fashion or another. I think the quick way to do that is a quick urine stick, if you can get urine. If not, you're going to rely on some of the, some of the serum tests, such as beta-hydroxybutyrate or serum ketones. Um, there's other labs that we always order with uh, diabetics when they look like they're in DKA, and that helps us make the diagnosis also to specifically know that it really is DKA and not a hyperglycemic patient that's acidotic for other reasons. When you look at the management of DKA, it first starts off looking at what is the pathophysiology. So number one is dehydration. And uh, just, I'm a kind of a particular about this. I want to make sure everyone understands the difference between dehydration and volume losses. So technically dehydration is lack of water. And there usually is a major water loss in these patients. When they're urinating uh, from the high glucose, they lose a lot of free water. Secondarily though, there are volume losses because there will be nausea, vomiting, etc. Finally, they have the hyperglycemia, they have the electrolyte imbalances, um, and then acid-base imbalance. Now, in general, as I sort of mentioned before, in many facilities across the country, diabetics are managed in an intensive care unit setting, and it's primarily because they're needing the, the insulin drip. So in your facility, if you can manage insulin drips for DKA outside the uh, intensive care unit setting, that's fine as long as you can monitor them frequently enough, and that's usually the limiting factor. So when we look at the management of it, obviously, the first thing that we always do with unstable patients is correct their intravascular losses. Now, if you look at all the literature in the world, almost everybody is going to tell you to start with normal saline. I actually prefer a more physiologic fluid, such as lactated ringers in these early, uh, uh, early hours. But again, nobody has any data as far as any uh, mortality data to prove one versus the other. Secondly, I don't get too excited about the free water losses early on. Um, a lot of times they will tell you uh, after a while and then when you start adding dextrose to your fluids to start use it as, as half normal saline, dextrose with half normal saline. I actually think that's um, not a good idea. Um, that when you look at who gets cerebral edema, the literature really struggles in trying to figure what are the primary factors that predispose to cerebral edema. And it's very, very difficult to predict in any one patient who's going to get cerebral edema. So I really don't give a lot of free water intake to those patients for the first 24 to 48 hours as I'm managing them. Thirdly, we obviously need to check their, to check their glucose, and that's primarily done with an insulin drip. Now, again, there's a lot of debate on whether you should give a bolus or not give a bolus. I like to give a bolus because if you start somebody typically on the rate that we do, which is about 0.1 units per kilo per hour, that means that basically by the end of the first hour of your drip, they finally only have six, seven, or eight units of insulin. So I like to give a bolus of 10 or 20 units as long as their glucose is decent uh, and then start them on the drip after that. Um, the electrolyte disturbances, people primarily talk about potassium, but I think magnesium and phosphorus are also very, very important. And again, if you look back and you look at the literature right now, they will tell you that, oh, do you need to check phosphorus and follow phosphorus or not? And the reason they say that, that it seems to be controversial, there was a study uh, many years back that looked at whether or not we ought to follow phosphorus levels, and it made no difference. But that, patient, that study had about 400, 500 patients in it. And when you look at a, a, a disease with a mortality of less than 1%, you're never going to show statistically significant differences in outcome uh, when you start off with uh, only four or 500 patients. So I think it's important to follow all of those electrolytes and make sure they stay normal. Obviously, we're correcting the acid base, base acid-based disorder, and that's primarily done with insulin. Insulin is the primary treatment that's going to correct the acidosis. Um, when you're giving your maintenance IV fluids, again, because of the acidosis, I think it's important to use the physiologic fluids so you can follow the acid base, and you're following it specifically from the DKA standpoint, and your electrolyte are not being um, changed by the uh, maintenance IV fluid that you're using. And then finally, it's very, very important to always look for precipitating factors. If you look in the literature, um, infection is the most common uh, reason for people to go into DKA. And the, um, I think it's important to measure uh, your variety of biomarkers, such as sepsis biomarkers, uh, acute MI biomarkers, et cetera.
So this is uh, some of my biases in the management of DKA. Again, because the mortality rate is so low, if you just give fluid and insulin, you're going to be able to fix 90% or more of typical DKA patients. And one of the things I tell my residents all the time as we're going through uh, teaching rounds is that most of the patients actually get better in spite of us, not because of us. And we need to make sure we don't take credit for something that uh, really we didn't do. Um, if you look at DKA patients when they're not very sick, and so if you define a not very sick DKA as somebody with a pH of greater than 7.2, then again, you can fix those with what I would say is, quote, suboptimal care. Um, but if the patients are really sick, and this would be the subset that we are a lot more likely to manage in my intensive care unit, uh, such as pH is less than seven, it really makes a difference whether you do it right the first time or not. But the key really is that whether it's a mild DKA or severe DKA, uh, what's right uh, for the bad one is just as right and not any more expensive or any more invasive than what's good for the less sick DKA patient. So when we look at our labs, this would be typical normal electrolytes for a patient that we'd be looking at, a sodium of 140, chloride around there, and an anion gap of 12. And everybody sort of talks about that's a, kind of the um, normal anion gap in my lab is around 12. Well, if you look at the unmeasured anions that make up the normal anion gap, it's usually albumin and phosphorus. And the equation that I like to use, I've seen other equations too, but this is a nice simple one, is that two times the albumin plus the phosphorus level will give you an, uh, the anion gap for that individual patient, the normal anion gap for that patient. So somebody comes in a DKA and they often have low sodium it's because their sugars are very high. Uh, their chloride is gonna be concomitantly low along with the sodium and their bicarb is low because they're acidotic. And so you go through your calculation and say, oh, well, they have an anion gap of 25. They have a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. And if it's a type one diabetic and they have ketones in their urine or something, this is most likely DKA. But remember, as you're following that patient, as you're continuing to go on, if you're using your anion gap to follow them to resolution, you gotta make sure that you continue to recalculate for what normal anion gap for that patient. So for instance, if their albumin drops because of their volume resuscitation, and if you're not following phosphorus levels, and the phosphorus levels drop to as low as one, and if the albumin's two, that actually gives you an anion gap normal for that patient of over only five. And so if you're following anion gap and you're stopping your insulin drip when the patients reach an anion gap of 12, you're actually still quite acidotic and actually have quite a few keto acids in the system. Now, is the patient gonna survive? Probably so, 90% of the time they probably will survive even though you stop the insulin drip early. So why measure the beta hydroxybutyrate level? Well, the bottom line is it is the unmeasured anion that we're looking for in the setting of DKA. And why, if we have access to this test, we would continue to start calculating anion gaps um, uh, to try to make a diagnosis really just sort of befuddles me in this, in this day and age. So we have access to the test, it's not an expensive test and we ought to be measuring it. So when we look at all the labs that we typically draw for a DKA patient, again, while, while they're on their drip, we're usually following their glucose levels every hour. Um, unless they have an R line, I don't monitor uh, even arterial blood gases or even venous blood gases. I know some people use venous blood gases, but if you're gonna, uh, if you don't have an R line, or I, I think you can just follow their chemistries every four hours. Um, again, serum or urine ketones are not typically measured after you've made the diagnosis because uh, as I'll show uh, a little bit later on, they don't correlate well uh, with resolution of the disease. And then lactic acid is not always consistently ordered. We order a lot of lactates in our facility uh, because of our sepsis protocol. But the bottom line is you can order beta hydroxybutyrates uh, with every one of the chemistries you order. If you're uh, usually ordering Q4 hour chemistries, you can order Q4 hour beta hydroxybutyrates and you'll know exactly when their gap is normal because uh, you can just stop the insulin drip when the beta hydroxybutyrate becomes normal. Now again, as I mentioned before, most clinicians treat until the quote gap closes. And I think that the problem with that is everybody's assuming that they continue to have a normal anion gap of 12, even though that individual patient may not. So what else, why else would we measure? Well, again, I think we should measure it in any acid-based disorder that we don't completely understand. Um, it's a good, quick uh, way to rule that out in the differential. I don't deal a lot with children, I do deal with adolescents, uh, but if you look at this article, it talks about overall mortality rate in diabetics and patients younger than 24, DKA accounts for uh, almost the majority of all of their deaths. But adult or pediatric, uh, 
If you follow beta-hydroxybutyrate, it helps you, uh, number one, make the diagnosis of DKA. Secondly, monitor their progress of therapy because as the, as the beta-hydroxybutyrate improves, the patient is clinically improving. And then finally, it also assess when the ketosis has resolved and you know exactly when you can stop your insulin drip and move on to sub-Q insulin. This slide is a pictorial description of acid-based chemistry. I don't, uh, although chemistry is one of my majors, I don't pretend to be a great chemist right now, but these are the three principal ketone bodies that are produced by the liver during DKA. So acetoacetic acid, acetone, and beta-hydroxybutyrate. And in DKA, beta-hydroxybutyrate is the primary one that's produced, and this is, of course is the one that causes most of the acid, essentially all of the acidosis in DKA. Now the problem is when you start looking at the other uh, tests that we used to do in our own facility, the ketone uh, body tests, et cetera, they use the nitro nitroprusside reaction. And the problem is the nitroprusside reaction only really works on acetone and acetoacetate and not on beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is the primary uh, ke ketone body, which is the acid produced during DKA. So to summarize, tests that employ the nitroprusside reaction only measure the acetoacetic acid and the acetone and not the beta-hydroxybutyrate except beta-hydroxybutyrate is the one that you really want to know. The other thing to remember is the patients are improving, the beta-hydroxybutyrate th that you're treating gets converted back over to the ketones. So this is the reason that we typically don't follow the ketones after we've made the diagnosis, because they often will rise uh, even though the patient's getting better. So you have this kind of paradoxical like, wow, is my patient getting better or worse? Stanbio's beta-hydroxybutyrate test only measures the beta-hydroxybutyrate, and that's primarily the one you want to know about anyway. It's the one that, that is the acid in uh, DKA. And this fact takes on, I think, a special importance when the patients are very unstable, the type of patients that we would get in our intensive care unit. Because when you look at the reaction, acidosis in and of itself, and other acidosis, such as lactic acidosis, will drive the action more towards beta-hydroxybutyrate uh, and less towards the other. So I think there's accuracy with monitoring if, you're, if you want to treat these patients well. Um, there was a recommendation by Sachs here. Blood ketone determinations that rely on the nitroprusside reaction should only be used to, as an adjunct to make the diagnosis and not to follow. And beta-hydroxybutyrate is the one that we should be following. So what is the impact of beta-hydroxybutyrate? How important is it? Well, I think it's important to the lab. It's a, it's a, it utilizes serum or plasma. It's non-subjective. Uh, it can be automated. It has reliable and reproducible results. I think it's important to the, in, uh, to the physicians because I think, it, number one, it improves the accuracy of the diagnosis, uh, specifically, especially if you're attempting to, to diagnose non-DKA. So I know in our institution, everybody who has a high glucose and is acidotic, everybody wants to assume that they're in DKA. But there's other reasons for those patients to be acidotic as well. Uh, and you want to make sure you're not missing lactic acidosis and dead bowel could be uh, aspirin overdose, et cetera, other things causing this. So it improves the diagnosis of DKA. Uh, you can follow the levels because they rise during DKA and they improve uh, as the patient is resolving DKA. It's quantitative, so you can follow it along. So I know we had a patient just the other day and there was a question whether or not the patient was insulin resistant or not. So we had him on our typical insulin dose for DKA. And as we were following our beta hydroxybutyrate levels in uh, one four hour, hour interval, they did not improve, and so that prompted us to increase uh, our insulin drip um, to make up for an insulin-resistant patient. And then finally, I think it helps in this differential diagnosis when you're looking at uh, some of the overlap syndromes, such as the hyperosmolar uh, non-ketotic uh, patient. And then finally, from the patient standpoint, it improves the level of diagnosis and improves the monitoring, and I think that um, it improves their uh, time in the hospital. That's a lot of times if you uh, follow these, you can get them out of DKA quicker. So finally, in summary, beta-hydroxybutyrate is accurate. It uh, uses serum or plasma. It's specific. It measures only the beta-hydroxybutyrate component. And it's quantitative. It's objective and gives you results that you can follow as opposed to serum ketones uh, with a ratio dilution. Uh, I want to thank you for your time today uh, listening to this. I hope that this has influenced you a little bit, thinking in terms of that beta-hydroxybutyrate is a better way of managing your DKA patient, and uh, maybe you can put it part of one of your order sets. Uh, and finally, if you'd like any more information, you can go to the link that we found at the bottom of this page today. Thank you very much.